Well, guys, I don't know how, but I didn't get the memo that Lyconius had actually released the next chapter of uh, the Great Brody Migration. And, well, since then, he's actually released uh, two more chapters. So, that's what I'll be reading today. The Great Brony Migration by Lyconius. Chapter 4. I think the whole thing is Chapter 4, actually. Because I did remember him having a uh, journal saying that Chapter 4 would be split into three parts. So, this will all be Chapter 4. Chapter 4, Part 1. On the ninth day, edge of the Everfree. Rain fell from a steel gray sky. The lethargic clouds swirled above, moving on the east, precisely on schedule. Rarity trotted along the road from Ponyville, her hooves splashing in the tiny puddles that gathered in the voids of the cobblestone. The soft plaiting of rain on her lavender and cream umbrella accompanied her on her hoofsteps. Not long ago, she would never have taken a step in the rain, but maybe Applejack's revelry in nature was starting to rub off on her. Still, she wasn't able to walk in the rain completely exposed. There were limits to even Applejack's ability to change things. Rarity always felt pensive in the rain and found herself thinking about her destination. Bronies were an odd bunch. Little over a week of teaching her etiquette classes had passed, and she was beginning to see how much work she, she had ahead of her. They were like little foals with a lifetime of dreams behind them. They were quick to learn and anxious to please, but they said and did things that would often leave her pleading for a respite between gales of laughter. A smile graced her lips as she thought of them. It was strange and exhilarating to talk with them, like she had hundreds of adoring little siblings all competing for her attention. She shouldn't let it go to her head, but it was awfully difficult not to take advantage of their zeal. Ever since Sweetie Belle left to study in Canterlot, she had never realized how much she missed the antics of a little foal. Granted, Sweetie Belle had long since grown up, in a matter of speaking. What was it about these bronies that made her think of them as little siblings? Did the camp have to be so far away? She crested the rise of a gentle, rolling hill, and the little tent city came into view. She was very impressed with her organization and cleanliness. What was even more impressive was their generosity. They were the most selfless ponies she had ever met. There was a lot for them to learn about being proper equestrians, but there was nothing she could teach them about her own element of harmony. It made her wonder, what happened that was so terrible that they had to leave their world? She had tried to ask them, but they avoided the subject. Unconsciously, she, her bottom lip thrust out in a pout. She should have brought her galoshes. The little streets had become rivers of mud, her steps slowed as she surveyed the path ahead, hunting for a less muddy way to the colorful carnival pavilion that served as her classroom. Isn't it crazy? Her ears perked up. What kind of accent? I don't know. Isn't it crazy? Her ears perked up. The distinct accent of a brony came to her from her left. Yeah, another voice replied. It's warmer than normal rain, don't you think? On the side of the road stood two bronies. A dark blue earth pony with a black mane and the other taller sky-blue pegasus with a glossy silver mane. She recognized them from her class yesterday. What were their names? Well, I'm sure I'll remember when I see their cutie marks. Her eyes slid over to their flanks, like ice on glass. Wait a minute. What was that? She narrowed her eyes at them. What was I looking for? She gave a s soft snort and hoofed the cobblestone. There was something I was looking for. What are they doing? The two colts hadn't noticed her. They stood in the rain. Faces pointed at the sky, eyes closed. The earth pony had his mouth open of all things, like he was catching the rain. Yep, he said after a swallow and a lick of his lips. That's not the way rain tastes on earth. This water is almost candy sweet compared to any I tasted in the city. He opened his mouth again, almost gleefully. Really? His companion immediately opened his mouth to the sky. Rarity rolled her eyes and started trotting over to them. Boys! She didn't try to startle them. She should have known better. Their eyes snapped open and they tried to inhale through mouths of rainwater. Mick, uh, <laughs> Miss Rarity, what? <coughs> the unfortunate Pegasus spluttered. His earth pony friend had his head between his forelegs, coughing violently. Rarity shook her head at them, a quick smirk to her lips. Boys, it doesn't matter if the rain is warmer here than it is back home. You can still catch a cold. She pulled her rain hat from her saddlebag and placed it on her head as she levitated the umbrella over to them. Really, let's get you out of this. Uh, Miss Rarity, are you okay? The Pegasus paused in helping his friend to his hooves. Rarity stood stock still, staring off into nothing. Her mouth opened mid-word. The brony's questions sailed past her ears, unheard. Her horn vibrated. Not just a tingle, but hard, fast oscillations, sending a buzz through her skull and rustling her tail. 
As suddenly as it came, the vibration left. She had to take a few moments to straighten her eyes. Oh, what the hay was that? She put a hoof to her forehead, heedless of the muddy rain and water on it. Uh, I, I don't know, Miss Rarity. What's going on? The Pegasus seemed to be the only one in the little trio gifted with gab. Whatever it was, it has passed. Rarity scouted her dirty hoof before sinking it to the ground with a splash. She couldn't think of any reason why she would have raised her, raised it to her head in the first place. Come along, we need to get you two dry before you get sick. She turned to the road and started down the hill, only wincing slightly at the squishy earth. Rarity glanced behind to make sure that they followed. Of course they did, and decided to try and get them to talk some more. I saw you two yesterday in my class, right? I'm sorry, but I've seemed to have forgotten your names. She batted her eyes at the silent earth pony. He smiled weakly, but straightened his neck and even got a bit of swagger to his step. My name is Noteworthy, Miss Rarity. There was a heavy note of deferment in his voice and posture. All of them did that around native ponies. She worried about that. The bronies were so impressionable, so meek, that any pony who wanted it could easily get to them and do anything she wished. Maybe that was why she thought of them like little siblings. I'm Silver Lining, the Pegasus trotted next to her. Or perhaps healed her was more accurate. He was of height to her, but managed to make himself seem smaller by stooping slightly. I've really enjoyed your classes, Miss Rarity. He looked up at her through sudden, through sodden locks of silver hair, the picture of adoration. Every other word was punctuated by a flex of his wings. Why, thank you, darling. She slowed to a stop and walked in front of him. But remember what I said about posture, silver lining? His eyes widened slightly. Um... That poor posture makes you a poor pony. He ventured a sheepish smile. Rarity nodded to his answer. Exactly. She lifted his head with a hoof and moved it to the side. Keep your head high. It puts a grateful arch to your neck. He was like a bolt of fine blue silk, eager for a shape to take. All she had to do was guide him to a form that would make him shine. You have a handsome mane and a lovely color. It would be a shame if no pony else saw you because you were hiding. Stand tall. Be confident. The mares will love you for it. She winked at him. Silver Lining held his head up even after she removed her hoof, beaming and blushing at the praise. Rarity smiled inwardly at the enormous control she had over him. With only a few words, she could bolster his self-esteem. It was indeed nice to be so adored. She turned and started trotting towards her pavilion again. What are you boys up to today? She asked, trying to strike up a more normal conversation. Noteworthy was the first to speak yet again. I get to work with Applejack today. He paused, a frown creeping into his face. I don't know how much help I will be, though. I'm kind of small, and, well, I'm not too good with my hooves. You'll do fine, dear. Rarity shot him another smile. Applejack is quite the gym. She's caring and kind and always happy to help a friend. Noteworthy shrugged and flicked his tail nervously. Miss Rarity. The soft, uncertain tone of his voice made her slow again, walking beside him in silver lining. Do you think we'll ever fit in? What does it really mean to belong someplace? The question took her by surprise. It sounded like a segue into the Brony's mysterious past. A topic they avoided like the memory of a terrible disease. What do you mean? It's hard adjusting to a new place, but I'm sure to get the swing of things soon enough. Noteworthy shook his head. It's not that, or, uh, I guess. It's just that, back in our world, I felt like an outsider all the time. His eyes slowly began to sink to the ground. The bounce leached out of his step. I convinced myself that I would be better here, but I still feel like I still feel like I don't belong. I I feel like a stranger. You and me both, bro. Silver lining sighed. He tossed his head to flip some locks of drenched mane from his face. I've been talking to some of the other Pegasi. They feel it too. Some of the members of A Wing and B Wing, who've already got to train with Rainbow Dash, they all say flying is great, but sometimes crazy stuff happens. Titus, one of our oldest flyers, just fell out of the sky yesterday, like his wings just stopped, just stopped working. Luckily, Cloudhopper was there, s snagged him out of a fall in the nick of time. He tossed his head again, flinging agitated raindrops around. I don't know, something's up. Rarity cocked her head at the strange expression. Are you saying that there is something wrong with Equestria, or something wrong with you, the Bronies? Silver Lining pursed his lips. I, I just don't know. From what I've heard of Rainbow Dash's lessons, things like that don't happen. She frowned hard and thought. It sounded like there was something working against the Bronies. Such a thing didn't exist in Equestria. Harmony wouldn't allow it. 
Sure, well, there was hardship, and bad things happened to good ponies, but magic going against them? She made a mental note to talk to Twilight about this. The sudden flapping of ribbons and the slight breeze pulled her out of her reverie. The spacious carnival pavilion stood in the light rain, the myriad of drops playing a soft staccato for the pastel audience underneath its protection. She had approached from a different direction than usual, and so the bronies had not noticed her yet. A low, excited walla filled the space with anticipation. Rarity paused just without the threshold of the pavilion and turned to imp- and turned to her impromptu companions. I have a few towels stashed here for the rain. You're welcome to them, she gestured to the pavilion with a hoof. Silver Lining shrugged and gave a quick flap of his wings. I wouldn't want to trouble you, Miss Rarity. Besides, I'm heading to the staging ground. I'll just get wet again. His gaze drifted off to the staging grounds that lay near the edge of the forest a few hundred yards away. What about you, Noteworthy? Can I talk you into staying for a spell? He nodded vigorously. I don't have to be anywhere till noon. I'll see you around, Note. It was nice talking to you, Miss Rarity. Oh, uh, don't forget your umbrella. Silver Lining nodded to the umbrella on his back. Rarity levitated the umbrella off of him and set it down just inside the pavilion. Thank you, Silver Lining. I wish I could be more help in answering your questions, but I just don't know enough about these sort of things. She started to lift a muddy hoof to her chin but stopped herself just in time. I'll talk to Twilight about it and get back to you. Is that okay? Both he and Noteworthy glanced at each other. Uh, you don't have to do that, Miss Rarity. Noteworthy said, lying, laying his ears back. It's not a big deal. I mean, I was just fe- I was just feeling homesick, I guess. Nonsense, darling. This is a big deal if you feel that way. How many other feel how many others feel the same? She quirked an eyebrow at them, trying to drive home her point. Noteworthy studied the ground. Silver lining had just shrugged again. Rarity let loose a light sigh. Don't worry. I won't tell any pony about it. I'll have to stop my class now. I'll see you next week. You bet. With a final nod to the earth pony and a quick bow to the white unicorn, the blue pegasus made his way to the staging grounds. Rarity and Noteworthy entered the pavilion. The assembled ponies hushed almost as one. A many-toned chorus of good morning, Miss Rarity, greeting her as she took her place before them. Good morning, every pony. Her sing-song salutation produced a collective sigh from the bronies. She smiled and shook her head at them as she levitated some towels from a raised chest set in the corner of a tent. Any pony need one? You shouldn't let rainwater dry on you. A couple hooves raised above the crowd. She sent one to each hoof and another to Noteworthy next to her. Once all the needed towels were distributed, she selected a new piece of chalk from her saddlebags and began to write, Dinner Etiquette on on her new chalkboard. Just as she finished, her chalk snapped in half. The remainder of the stick instantly ground to dust in her telekinetic grip. Like the chalk, the world world fell to pieces, all of it gone in an instant blizzard, the likes of which she had never seen. Her head vibrated on her neck, threatening to detach itself. She registered cries of alarm in the back of her mind, the all-consuming pain in her horn blotting out other senses. Miss Rarity! Quick! Some pony get- <clears throat> Some pony! Get some pony! What? I don't care who! Okay, yes I do. Get a doctor! Is Nurse Redheart here today? The voice was thin, like it echoed down a long tunnel. Where do we move the hospital tent to? Another panicked voice answered. The corner of North and Everfree, go! The first voice shouted. The world came back into focus just as quickly as it had disappeared. Rarity was on her side, an anxious crowd of ponies all around. Her horn felt tender. Small tremors ran through it like aftershocks from a powerful earthquake, making her cringe with every beat of her heart. A soft groan escaped her as she attempted to raise her head. What? There's something... There's something happening at the staging grounds! A female voice exclaimed from the edge of the small cluster of ponies. A thunderclap shattered the air. At least it should have been a thunderclap. It rumbled for far too long, becoming a deep, sustained tone that shook the ground beneath her and seemed to pull out the very air in her lungs. All the ponies in the pavilion covered their ears. Several of the unicorns present dropped to the ground, four hooves clutching their heads. The sonorous thunder reached a new low, so loud it was a wonder the ground did not undulate in response. A blinding ray of light. No, not light. Molten pure magic seemed to pierce the crowd of ponies surrounding her. The corners of her vision constricted, darkness encroaching on the brilliance of the magic before her, until all faded to black bliss.
dark, wet. Some of the wet trickled down her face, a sweet-smelling wet. The other wet stuck to the sides of her head, unpleasantly pulling at her coat. She lifted a hoof to the side of her head, but nothing happened. Where was her hoof? Where was everything? Her eyes were heavy, sealed shut by the fragrant wetness. Something soft, something tight, pressed on her head. A bandage, that's what it was called. A bandage over her eyes. Why could, why could she not feel her hooves or legs? If only she could open her eyes, maybe she could remember. Remember. Where was she? Who was she? She gave an involuntary jolt as sounds came crashing into her ears, feeling the void that once was occupied by her lonely heartbeat. There was sound, a lot of it. Whispers. No, not whispers. Shouts and crying. All of it building on the foundation of a low rumble. Thunder. Thunder and light. A light. She saw one, recently. A light so bright and pure even the memory of it made her body shake. Cold. Oh, so very cold. Her hooves were cold, and she could feel them now. She wished she couldn't. Voices, too many to distinguish, made a din heavy with pain. What was this place? What was this place? So full of sorrow and darkness. She tried to turn her head, but little happened. A frustrated sob sounded in her ears. Was that her voice? Or one of the many around her? Just as the soft light of the moon breaks through the clouds, a familiar voice separated itself from the cacophony. Do you have a damage report for me, Rainbow Dash? Like music, it wrapped around her ears, the dull set tones comforting her. The storm is barely under control, a second voice answered. Though it was tired, the familiar brash proclamations lifted her spirits. I've got the whole Ponyville weather team out there, and it's all we can do to keep it contained. Any word from Cloudsdale? Their teams are maxed out. Cloudsdale itself only has reserves left to keep it from being consumed. There's a massive tornado head straight for Philadelphia. Stalingrad is under flanks height of snow. Candela is getting clobbered by hoof-sized hail. Everything's a mess. We're on our own. If we don't get some reinforcements soon, I don't want to think what will happen. Can't you use the bronies? There's plenty of Pegasi who weren't at the staging grounds. They should be good to go, right? A heavy sigh preceded the second voice. I don't know, Twilight. They can be worse than foals at flying. If I could have gotten to the training facilities at Cloudsdale, no. Even then, I don't think I could use them. I'd be spending all my time saving their flanks and not taking care of this thing. What about the groups we've already trained? Some help is better than none. A-Wing and B-Wing? B-Wing is out of commission. They were all down at the staging grounds when the portal thing collapsed. It's going to be weeks before they can fly again. I can see half of A-Wing is here. They're on the same cloud as B-Wing. The others, they wouldn't know what to do in a storm like this. Twilight. She knew this name, and Rainbow Dash. Why did she remember them, and not her own? A frigid tingle danced down her spine. Hmm. Well, according to my list, the two wing leaders aren't here. Have you talked to Cloudhopper and Titus? It won't hurt to try, Rainbow. Yes. She could recognize that tenacious optimism. She tried once again to raise a hoof, but her feeble attempt was thwarted by a soft barrier. A blanket? How could such a small thing stop her so easily? Why was it so cold? T twi twilight A pathetic mule parted her lips. Doctor! Doctor! Come quick! I think she's coming around! This voice was not at all familiar. Its sudden advent caused her to recoil. Twilight! She asked again trying to make herself heard over the nightmarish noise. Soft hoofsteps answered her plea. I'm here, Rarity. Rarity. Was that her name? Blindly, she reached for the familiar voice, the blanket once again giving her trouble. Warm, familiar hooves moved, or moved the blanket for her, allowing her to wrap the crooks of her fetlocks around Twilight's forelegs. Say my name again. This voice, so feeble and desperate, was it really hers? Rarity, Twilight ventured. Rarity, she whispered back. Yes, that was her name. Thunder boomed, muffled as if it from a great distance, but the vibrations shook the bed of straw and blankets on which she lay. Memories, clear and sharp, rushed into her mind like the cold waters of a mountain stream. What happened, Twilight? Where am I? It's okay, Rarity, you're fine. You're safe. The doctor's here. He'll take good care of you. 
Twilight cooed at her, stroking Rarity's mane with a hoof. Don't leave me, she hissed, panic, l panic taking hold of her at the thought of being alone in this perpetual darkness. I'm not going anywhere, Rarity. Twilight's voice was like a branch to which she could cling to the dark, rushing river of, all of sound all around her. Scents began wafting to her, some sharp, others sweet. A heavy metallic scent muddied the otherwise clean smell of rain and wet earth. The portal opened again, but something went terribly wrong. I was in Ponyville at, at the time, getting Spike, and I could feel the surge in magic. I can only imagine what it felt like this close to it. This close? Images flashed in Rarity's mind. The pavilion, the towels, the chalk stick, a white light. She shivered again. Welcome back, Miss Rarity. I'm Dr. Valor. A low, smooth, and well-cultured voice came out of the pall of sounds. How are you feeling? It reminded her of Fancy Pants' voice. Cold, Rarity whispered. We'll have to fix that. Another set of hooves trotted off, soon lost in the incessant rumbling of thunder. Twilight, can you lift her leg for me? I need to listen to her lungs. Yes, that one. Thank you. Rarity felt her feeble foreleg rise above her head, then an ear pressed against her chest. Breathe as deeply as you can, Rarity. Let it out slowly. Rarity did as instructed. The deep, deliberate breaths cu coupled with Dr. Valor's tranquil voice and Twilight's presence calmed her even more. The cold she felt upon awakening began to fade slightly. Very good, Rarity. Everything sounds great. The ear lifted from her chest, and her leg was tucked under the blanket once more. How is your head? Do you have a headache, or is your horn tender at all? No, she said, surprised. From what she remembered of this morning, she should have a splitting headache. Well, what's wrong with my eyes? There had to be something wrong. Why else would they bother to bandage them? Fear struck her without warning. Did she look into that molten pure light? Had it taken her sight into the infinitely white depths? Don't worry, Rarity. Nothing is wrong with your eyes. The bandage is just a precaution. Many of the others, unicorns especially, who are close to the staging grounds, complain of sore, achy eyes. We put a salve of aloe and tolu on it to help with swelling. I suppose we can remove it now. Would you like that? Dr. Valerie's voice was calm and in control. Even so, there were, undertone, there were undertones of weariness. Yes, please. Rarity managed to speak. Twilight, can you grab that damp cloth there? Thank you. The pressure of the bandage loosened as the doctor unwrapped it from her head. Layer by layer, the darkness began to retreat. She felt a slight tingle as the cloth ran over her eyes, wiping away the fragrant salve. There, good as new. She cracked one eye, squinting at the bright interior of the cavernous canvas construction. Lightning flashed, throwing grotesque shadows of the scene before her. A triple row of beds, some made of straw wrapped in blankets. Some were cots with a shiny metal frame and dull-colored fabric. Others looked to be made out of the tattered remains of the strange tents that bronies had brought with them. Filled the entire floor of the spacious tent. Blood, bright against the white bandages and the muted green of flattened grass, seemed to be everywhere. The heavy metallic scent suddenly made her want to vomit. Never in her life had she seen so much blood. Never enough to smell. The wan, magenta light coated everything in an ethereal glow. All she could manage was a slight turn of her head to look at her companions. Twilight's concerned face was just above her, a damp rag held in her magenta telekinesis. Below her, an unfamiliar pony sat next to her bed. He was a white pegasus, not unheard of, but still not all common, with a pink striped white mane. He had on a white vest sewn with numerous pockets of various sizes, of varying sizes over a black garment that extended all the way to his haunches. It also sported several large pockets stuffed with bandages. The outlines of several other objects were visible through the fabric, their identities and uses she could only guess. A flutter of cerulean blue drew her gaze to a very sodden but beaming rainbow dash. It's good to see you're finally awake! She remarked at how she brushed aside some multicolored hair. Twilight worried about you something awful. Thought I'd never hear the end of it. Rainbow let a soft laugh even as she looked away furtively. Well, gotta get back to that storm. I'll track down Cloudhopper and Titus, Twilight. If you don't hear from me in an hour, just assume I'm saving some pony. She sauntered off and was soon lost to Rarity's constrained sight. She focused her attention to the white pegasus. Dr. Valor, I presume? 
Her voice was still breathy and somewhat soft, no matter that she did her best not to sound flustered. A tiny smile played across his lips, like a silent laugh at a private joke. Indeed, Miss Rarity. No! Give me Sethisto! The desperate cry startled them all. It's important! Gah! Ugh! Just get me him! Dr. Valor stood up and trotted over to the source of the commotion. Rarity gasped when she saw the pony making all the noise. He was a white unicorn, but his horn ended in a jagged stump not halfway down its length. His platinum mane was messy and singed in several places. A white bandage, wrapped around his middle, was soaked through with blood. N need to tell him! Tell him that the cartographer is dead! The cartographer is dead! Rarity turned to Twilight. What is he saying? Who's the cartographer? Twilight shook her head. I have no idea. He was one of the bronies who came through the portal today. There were four of them, and all of them were beaten up. Twilight shuddered. Dr. Valor called their wounds gunshots, but I never heard of such a thing. Apparently, they're caused by some sort of weapon on their world. The... The porch light is out, and the keys are missing. The injured unicorn's utterance, utterances be, began to take on an even more desperate edge, even as he struggled to speak. Four dreams lost. Four dreams lost. That last was muffled by the cloth Dr. Valor placed over the distraught unicorn's mouth and nose. After only a few breaths, he fell asleep. Dr. Valor shook his head, stuffing the cloth into an unused pocket that seemed to appear out of nowhere. I hate doing it this way, Daystar he said, turning to a pastel cream unicorn with a windswept to two-tone blue mane. Fetch Dark Wisp and tell him White Light had a cipher for Sethisto. Be quick. Daystar nodded sharply and galloped from the large tent. Twilight closed her eyes as he passed, bowing her head in concentration, her horn glowing bright with magic. Behind Rarity, the angry tumult of a storm in full rage blasted forth, momentarily drowning out the miserable din of the tent's occupants. The tempid sounds muted once again when Twilight opened her eyes and released a pent-up breath. I really hope Rainbow can get this storm under control soon. I don't know how long I can keep up a force field this big. Rarity forced a weak foreleg out of her blanket to place a hoof on her friends. Four dreams lost. White Light whispered. There's no sense to Rarity, but, s but that single sorrowful sentence brought the cold back to her chest and weighed down her soul. Chapter 4, Part 2 On the Ninth Day, Canterlot Serial Velocity, steward of the Bronies and, former, and formerly head of Equestrian Innovations, stared out of the window in his accommodations high in the guest wing of the Royal Palace. From this vantage, he could see out over the grand city of Canterlot to the hills and the vales westward of Ponyville. Seth snored obnoxiously next to him, Equestrian ideas of pro propriety were certainly odd. Well, perhaps not odd. It was different, to say the least. For several years, they had been living in a co-ed fashion, not by choice. For the past two years, he had been around Foe and Seth constantly, and the other bronies had shared their living spaces similarly while they were in hiding. In becoming ponies, certain things seemed silly to keep observing. Still, he would have preferred to room with Foe, she at least was quiet. Seth gave another snort. Cyril's ear twitched. All right, Seth, time to get up. He wheeled from the window and plodded over to the beds. Come on, Seth. He growled at the lump of blankets. The lump replied. Cyril snorted. What was that, Seth? He prodded at the lump with a hoof, receiving only a few more grunts in return. Really, Seth? We're in Canterlot, and you're just going to lie there. <laughs> mm, I got a trick for you, Trixie. <laughs> Seth's muffled voice slurred out of the mass of sheets. You want a trick? Cyril snickered, his horn gathering a faint light. How's about this? He closed his eyes, following Twilight's instructions, and cleared his mind. He reached out with the ley lines that gathered to his horn feeling out the contents of the room and isolating the object he wanted to manipulate. He singled out the mattress of the bed because it was larger and therefore easier to get by itself. He severed the unused ley lines that trailed off to various, th various things nearby and focused his attention. This was the tricky part. He called more magic to his command, he wasn't sure how exactly, and pushed the magic at the mattress. 
A soft grunt issued from him as the mattress pushed back, resisting his command to move. Ciro took a deep breath and summoned more magic, twirling the ley lines in the cords to, that he could move to channel more power. In his mind's eye, he could see the magic ley lines, running from his horn, to the mattress, back to his horn, then off to a distant origin that was always out of sight. They seemed to come from every direction, like his horn was a focal point, and yet, he felt like they all came from a central, fo a central source. Another experimental push on the mattress met with little resistance. He opened his eyes, confident that he had gathered enough energy to do what he wanted, to ruin Seth's Trixie dream. With a final mighty mental shove, he flung the amassed ma magic at the mattress, violently flipping it into his side. Shuff! The Seth ball of blankets cried as it flew from the mattress to the floor in an oppressive arc. The light blue aura vanished from the mattress as Cyril laughed at the tangled mess. The ball of sheets ride on the floor for a few moments before a hoof appeared followed by an annoyed Seth face, resplendent in bedhead and of red mane. You trying to kill me, dude? He grumbled. This only made Cyril laugh harder. As if you could injure the great and powerful Sethisto. Ha! You should thank me for ending your little dream before Trixie made mincemeat out of you. Seth untangled himself from the rest of the blankets, kicking them aside. You mark my words, Cyril Velocity, he said, jabbing the air with an admonishing hoof. One of these days I'll find her, and when I do, nothing can stop me. When Ciro laughed, rather than being cowed, Seth stomped off the floor with a, huff, with a huff. Ciro wiped a tear from his eye. <laughs> oh, -ho, you're a hoot, Seth. Stop you doing what, exactly? I can only imagine a few things that Trixie's lack of appearance would stop you from doing, and that is a road better left untraveled. Mock all you want, Stuart. I'm happy to dream while the rains pass to other hooves. Seth tried to force his man into some semblance of order, unsuccessfully. The mirth of only a moment before met an early demise at this remark. Cyril could almost feel anew the invisible mantle that fell on him that day. Celestia named him Stuart of Bronies. Look, Seth, you're not mad at me, are you? I mean, for kind of taking over, uh, everything? Seth stopped attacking his mane long enough to shoot a raised eyebrow at him from under his foreleg. You're a little late to be asking if I'm mad, dude. If I was, you know, you'd know. Trust me. What do you mean? Pish. He took over like two years ago when we decided to come to Equestria. It was your show, man. I don't mind. He turned to the window. I ran EQD for almost eight years, and even then I was more of a glorified coordinator, you know? But. Everything changed that night when Foe almost died. When we all got close to biting the dust, it was out of my hands by then. The silence stretched in the thin morning light. Cyril remembered that night. It haunted his dreams from time to die from time to time. A constant reminder of what could have been. It seemed so long ago, a lifetime in a world away. A soft knock broke the silent spell. Come in, Cyril called to the door. He turned just in time to see Foe's face pop into existence, completely expressionless. So, how long have you been listening, Foe? Her eyes widened for a split second before narrowing dangerously. She tilted her head to the side in a haunty, haughty manner as she practically high-stepped into the room. I don't eavesdrop cereal, and if you must know, I was there only long enough to hear you two ramble about who's in charge. Honestly. You sound like old war vets the way you talk about the flash mob night. Look, you're doing it again. You scale like a soldier with PTA PTSD. Of all the ponies here, foe, Seth started, but she wasn't about to let him get a, a hoof in the door. Yes, yeah, yeah, I should be most grateful, and I can't thank you enough for saving my life. But you guys are missing the point, I think. She shook her head. The past is the past. It's far away, and it can't hurt us anymore. She flexed her wings and then fluttered over to the window, sweeping a hoof across the picturesque view. Just look at where we are! Equestria! The land of our dreams! She looked over her shoulder at them, her face open and smiling. Don't bring old nightmares into it, okay? Three tiny chimes wavered in the air from a silver clock in the mantle of the fireplace, the third hour from sunrise. Cyril once again felt the burden of his responsibilities. In ten minutes' time, they were to be at the High Court to present the Bronies to the Court of Canterlot for a formal acceptance as citizens of Equestria. He looked to his friends, 
Even though they had no direct part to play in this presentation, they both adopted determined expressions. Shall we? Serial gestured to the door. Foe nodded, once again flying back. That's my ringtone. But anyway. Foe nodded, once again flying back to the door as Seth stood. Foe stood by the door, gave him a small bow and said, After you, fearless leader. Serial chuckled and rolled his eyes at her as he passed. In the hall, four members of the Royal Guard waited to escort them to the Grand Throne Room. The little company walked through the beautiful halls of the palace in silence. Cyril tried to think about what he was going to say to the court, but the majesty of his surroundings distracted him. The palace was one huge, seamless sculpture of brilliant white stone. He had never seen its likeness anywhere, not even in his most fanciful dreams. The stone was not white by virtue of its color alone. Rather, it glowed with an inner light from the countless flecks of gemstone and pearl. The air itself seemed to hum with a vibrancy that infected him with joy. The decorations of the halls, no matter how simple these, ha these halls were in the guest's quarter, was of the finest workmanship. Nothing, no expense, or the minutest, minutest of detail was spared in their placement or construction. If, we, if he were to imagine a place more perfect, he wouldn't do it the palace justice. It truly was the home of goddesses, a temple of sorts, made to reflect and enhance their beauty and power. They turned down another hallway, and three identical signs of awe echoed in the great hall. Grand white columns grew from the intricate mosaic flooring like ancient white trees. They were carved with such care that Cyril could actually see a wood grain, he would almost believe that they were once trees now turned to stone. Their marble branches gleamed in the light as he held up a ceiling of ocean waves frozen in time. The stone froth of petricide surf was filled with topaz and blue glass, bathing in the expanse of a soft blue light splintered by tiny rainbows. Between the column trees, the walls held stained glass renditions of important scenes from equestrian history. They passed beneath the gazes of ancient heroes and under the shadows of Equestria's darkest hour. The anxiety that Siru had felt since walking started to take on a new dimension. It was a strange mixture of excitement, determination, and hope with a smattering of fear. The presentation to the court today was only a formality. The princesses had already placed the refugees under their personal protection. What was he afraid of? All thoughts vanished. The great hall and its wonders of stone were no more. A high-pitched ringing filled his ears. So loud, it made his eyes water. He would have cried out in pain if he could find his voice. His horn vibrated, shaking his eyes in their sockets and sending waves of numb numbness down his back. Plock! Serial! Serial Velocity! You in there? Plock, plock, plock. Serial blinked. Foe sat on her haunches in front of him, her hooves poised and clapped once again in his front of his face. What? Serial asked, staring cross-eyed at the hooves in front of him. She lowered her hooves, not quite satisfied that he had returned to the world of the living. You and Seth, that's what. Is this going to be a thing for you guys? I'm not going to catch you when you faint like some prissy girl. Wait, what? Who fainted? I didn't. Seth slouched his head low to the ground as he sat on one side like he was in the midst of picking himself up. One of the guards lent him a shoulder to help him up the rest of the way. Uh-huh, was all Foe deemed to say as she turned back to the massive red and gold door to the grand throne room. I just tripped, Foe, Seth said. Whatever you say, Seth Histo. It was hard to tell sometimes when Foe was being sarcastic. Serial had known her for several years, and even so, now was one of those times. Seth turned his head a little to glare at her, but didn't pursue the argument. Instead, he addressed Serial. Do you think the buffer is wearing off? I mean, they're just on the other side of those doors. Serial shook his head and started walking again. No, that was something else. It didn't feel good at all. Besides, we were, we've been working with magic for a whole week, and a lot of that time with the princesses and nothing had happened before. They stopped in front of the ornate doors. Two of the guards stepped forward and in unison knocked twice. A few moments passed before the distinctive voices of both Princess Celestia and Luna called out, Enter! The doors were enveloped by magical auras summoned by the two guards, swinging open silently. Golden light spilled from the doorway, mixing with the soft blue of the hall. The throne room was a long oval, the narrow end situated in the hall behind the dais da that held the two magnificent thrones. Cyril's eyes went straight to the princesses. Everything in the room seemed built to point at them. Celestia sat upon a throne of gold-chased ivory. 
the symbol of the sun high above her head, atop the elaborately carved back. Ivory lighting radiated from the golden sun, intertwining with the wisps of what looked like real cloud. Little pinpricks of flame danced around the princess of the sun, winking in and out of existence while riding the ever-present but untouchable currents that caused her mane to flow around her. Any light that fell into the nebulous hair was shattered into brilliant colors in a manner that glass and gems could only dream. Luna sat on a silver-chased ebony throne that was as dark as Celestia's was bright. A silver crescent moon was set into the solid back of the throne. Silver spirals and mazes surrounded it and flowed down to the ruby-inlaid feet. Ephemeral magenta and royal blue nebulae swirled around the princess of the night, lending a shadow to her cord tenants. With every gentle wave of her midnight mane, Cyril could see into the vast reaches of the star-strewn sky. The dais upon which they sat was a constructed was a construction of roughly hewn red vein marble that put the feet of the thrones just above eye level. A small moat surrounded the dais, filled by a fountain that gurgled that gurgled pleasantly behind the sisters royal. Cyril, Seth, and Foe stepped forward into the chamber, their hoofsteps muffled by a thick azure rug. A few whispers and mutterings drew Cyril's attention to the rest of the room. To his right and left were a set of raised seats made of dark wood that gleamed with polish. The seats were contained by carved railings, not unlike stadium bleachers, three rows deep. The delegates of the high court watched as the three humans become ponies, walked slowly into to an elevated platform of stone inlaid with curious design. As Cyril got closer, he noticed that it looked like an alchemical symbol. Several circles within circles surrounded by triangles and octagons interspersed with a lettering he did not recognize. The delegates of the courts were unicorns, pegasi, and earth ponies, an equal number of each tribe present. It suddenly occurred to him that they were their own delegation. He, Seth, and Foe had no earth pony representative. Too late now. His hoofsteps rang loud and intrusive on the stone platform. Seth and Foe stood to either side of it, gazing determinately at the princesses on their thrones. Celestia raised a golden shod hoof and tapped three times on a crystal pedestal standing between the thrones. The pedestal rang true as a perfect bell, a light tone that sounded at once as if it was a gong as it did from a trumpet or violin or flute. The three ponies at the center of the room bowed deeply to the immortal diarchs. Rise, Serial Velocity, Stuart of the Bronies, Luna commanded. Rise, says Thisto and Foe, emissaries of the court. Serial straightened from his bow, holding his head high and trying to impart strength and resolve to his stance. Luna rose from her throne and spread her wings wide. You! And those who follow you, known as the Bronies, came here as strangers, as refugees. You came to Equestria by means of unknown magic, heavy laden with destiny on your backs. You came in the night, and so I, Luna of the Night, do claim right and prerogative over your lives. She turned to the crystal pedestal and tapped it once with a platinum shod hoof. Luna turned again to the center of the room. From this day forth, let it be known that the Bronies are subject to me. From this day forth, let it be known that the one called Serial Velocity is my right hoof, mouthpiece, and envoy. Again, the Dark Princess tapped the crystal. No sooner had its enchanting tone dissipated than another proclamation rang through the massive chamber. On this day, and forever after, let it be known that they and their descendants are citizens of Equestria. They are bound by its laws, tied to its land, and one with its heart. A third toll of crystals filled its ears and he could hear in Luna's words echo. Celestia stood, unfurling her white wings. She alighted from the dais to walk around the gray unicorn, the yellow unicorn, and the white pegasus. I, Celestia of the day, her ancient voice infused with air of energy, making the stone beneath Cyril's hooves hum along to her words. Do hear and support my sister, Luna of the night. She came to a stop in front of him, with his gaze held firmly in her own she, she intoned. Serial Velocity, do you solemnly swear to hold true to the responsibilities of Stuart? A hundred questions and fears raced through his head, even as he uttered, I do. Celestia placed a hoof on one of the letters carved onto the platform. The thin circle running through the letter filled with light as she removed her hoof and again spoke. Serial Velocity, do you solemnly swear to uphold the laws and ideals of Equestria? The laws he knew very little of, and the ideas he could imagine. I do. The second, then third letter came to life with the same light as the first. As you remain true to your oaths, Serial Velocity, special rights, privileges, and powers will be granted you. 
the light of the circle bled out to other etchings, spreading the changing color from a brilliant white to a deep blue. The stone hummed louder beneath him. Delegates of the High Court, she called out, not breaking eye contact with him. Voices of the tribes, what say ye? He saw movement from the corner of his eye and heard a rustling, but could not break hold of Celestia's eyes. He dared not even blink. The Pegasus tribe, a deep voice from his from the right announced, accepts his oath. Another rustle of ponies standing came from his right. The unicorn tribe accepts his oath. A breathy female voice answered. Finally, from behind Celestia, the earth pony stood. Their numbers split between the right and left sides of the room. A thin, reedy male voice entered, answered Celestia's query. The earth pony tribe accepts his oath. Luna descended from the dais and joined her sister before the platform. As one, they proclaim, So be it. They lowered their horns to his shoulder as the light from the platform intensified, washing over him like an ocean wave. In an instant, the light was gone and the stone quiet once more. The throne room filled with applause from the gathered delegates, stomping on the floors of the wooden bleachers. Seth and Foe joined in. Cyril pounded on the stone with one hoof as well. He smiled, but felt stretched. He breathed heavily, feeling as though his body was being pressed on all sides. Celestia smiled at him warmly before turning to the assembled court. Official court business has concluded, my friends. The applause died down. You may speak with Foe and Sethisto here. Luna and I must speak with Cyril, if you will excuse us. The members of the court, as well as Foe and Seth, bowed to the princesses in acceptance. Celestia and Luna walked around the platform. Come, Cyril, there is much to discuss. Luna bade him. He stepped from the platform and walked stiffly to them. Just before they left the throne room, he shot an encouraging smile back to his friends. They waved in return as their large doors swung shut. Chapter 4 Interlude Words in a White Room Small and cramped, and way too much white, a young man, late twenties, dark brown hair, lanky and all-around average, turns his head this way and that, like the camera in the upper corner of the room. Yup, too much white. That pretty much sums up the room in which wit sits. It had to be an interrogation room, no doubt. It had a camera, watching his every move in a one-way mirror window. Like that was supposed to fool him into thinking he was alone or something. All it needed was one of those big Hollywood lamps so they could shine it in his face. Instead, it had one big white light on the ceiling and a stainless steel table. No guard. That could be a good thing or a bad thing. They probably thought it was unnecessary. He was stuck in a wheelchair on account of his leg with a hole in it. If he did try to escape, well, he'd be thwarted by the first flight of stairs he came through. The blue painted steel door opens to admit an older man in a dark, sharp-cut suit. He has a sleek black tablet computer in his hand, and what, and what he probably thought was a disarming smile on his face. Wit was pretty impressed. So the feds have moved into the future. No more bulky, manila folder stuffed with papers to slam on the table. Hello. I'm Agent Barker, FBI. He pulls out a black leather wallet and flashes his bat at Wit, and flashes his badge at Wit. Wit sees it long enough to register the letters FBI printed on it before the so-called Barker flips it away back into his pocket. So, Joey, the agent says. How do you know my name? Wit snaps. Barker smiles. We ran your prints, pulled everything we have on you. Though, it's not what we expected to find. Barker furrowed his brow and frowned at the reports on the table. In an instant, a well-practiced smile again appears. Wit scowls at the agent. Anyway, you are Joey Netterman, otherwise known as Wit. Which do you prefer, Joey or Wit? Barker switches on the tablet, swiping in a past gesture. Wit's fine, he said, those two words so dripping in venom that agent should be dead where he sat. Barker taps a few fingers on the steel table, holding his cleft chin with one hand, his eyes darting over the hostile young man. I'm not your enemy, Wit. I'm here to help you. You killed four of my friends, G-Man. Wit growls. Barker swipes again with the practice motion on the surface of the tablet. Wit, active member of several online forums, of 200,000 posts in the past four years on one site in particular, Ponychan. Care to tell me what this Ponychan is about, Wit? Wit continues to try and bore a hole through the agent with steady glare. 
We believe that this Pony Chan site has connections with the domestic terrorist group Anonymous. Do you have any information regarding that, Wit? Pony Chan has nothing to do with Anons, G Man. Barker spreads his hands, inviting, like the maw of a Venus flytrap was inviting. Enlighten me then. Wit snickers, clutching a fist. Pish, like you care about the truth. Ah, but that's why we are here, Wit. Barker gives up from his chair to lean on the steel table. And now, the punchline. Like I said, I'm not your enemy. If anything, I'm your friend. Two days ago, someone made a big mistake. Two days ago, you lost your four friends because of that mistake. And I'm here to try and fix that. You can't just fix dead friends. Wit hisses through clenched teeth. Barker stands up, holding his hands in a plucking gesture. Okay, bad word choice. I'm sorry. No, you're not, Wit says under his breath. Scowling at the false mirror, his reflection scowls and turn at the agents in the room. Listen, Wit. We've pulled files on all of you that we found in the industrial park. The worst crimes we could find on any of them was petty internet piracy and a few unpaid parking tickets. Now... We were told and given strong evidence by several sources that the compound known as Friendshipping Express Incorporated was a false front for a terrorist sleeper cell. Turns out, they lied. The bastards. Witt's eyebrow shot straight up into his hair. Had he been able, he would have jumped to his feet. That's crazy. I... What? Who the hell? Corban. A hand flies to his forehead. Barker raises an eyebrow at Witt. Who is Corban? Witt runs a hand through his hair. They're the anti-bronies, the ones who had been dogging us around. Barker pinched the bridge of his nose, exhaling noisily into it before glancing at Wit again. I'm sorry, I, I don't follow. Anti-bronies? Wit gives the agent a withering look. Bronies are fans of My Little Pony, G-Man. Don't tell me you've never heard of us. Two years ago, a bunch of members of Corbane crashed a brony convention, destroyed stuff, burned the building to the ground. It was all over the news. My Little Pony... <laughs> I know that show. My granddaughter loves it. Does that make her a, uh, what do you call it? Brony. Yeah, not really. Wit leans forward, wincing slightly at the pain in his leg. Bronies are usually older fans, most of them guys, like me. Pony Chan was just one of probably hundreds of pony sites that we used to talk to each other. About ponies. He shoots the agent a wry smile, turns smirk. Okay, I can see that. But how do you explain the stolen equipment we found destroyed in that warehouse and why it was rigged with explosives? Wit fidgets, shifting his gaze to everything but Barker. He glances at the tablet, a list of stolen items from a couple universities scrolling on the screen. That's complicated. Barker looks at his watch. We have time. Wit looks reluctant, shifting his gaze back to the mayor, so Barker speaks up again. We just want the truth, Wit. I promise we will get to the bottom of this, with or without your help. I think it would be better, and faster, if you did help. Better for us. Better for you. Better for your friends. There have been four innocent deaths. We need to know who's responsible for feeding us false information. If this core band group is behind it, we'll shut them down. This group sounds a lot like Anonymous, and I've been trying to pin them down for years. But this is the first time a hacker group has used mob tactics and apparently they had their sights on hurting you and your friends. I don't take kindly to bullies like that, Wit. Wit closes his eyes. It started after the convention got trashed. I was there. One of the guys that ran one of, the, one of the most popular pony sites, Equestria Daily, had an idea. What if we could leave Earth? And there you have it. Chapter 4 of the Great Brony Migration. All three parts. All in one video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to comment, rate, and subscribe. And maybe next time, just maybe... I may have a song for you all. So until then... <laughs>